Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Lozon and I look after the uh, Chippewas of Naywash on Cedar First Nation Fisheries Assessment Program. And I've been doing that since 2008. And I'd just like to say that I may have uh, Robin's presentation beat on the graph department because I think I only have one. So I won't make anybody look at too many graphs. It's gonna be a bit of a different presentation altogether. So as, you, as the uh, title illustrates, this really is a, a kind of an introduction to the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation fisheries. So to start, I figure the best uh, spot to start is to get a little bit of an idea of the area that we're talking about. So you can see the highlighted area which represents the territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation is composed of two sister First Nations. We have the Chippewas of Nawash and Cedar First Nation, as well as the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. And uh, these two sister First Nations share the same territory. And as such, um, there is a joint, joint chiefs and councils that meet together to discuss topics uh, that relate to the uh, territory as a whole. So just a little bit about the history of the fishery and I think it's really important if you want to understand anything about the uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation that you have to take a, a step back and, and look into the history. So um, since time immemorial we had um, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation uh, membership fishing for um, trade. There were vast trade networks that uh, uh, existed for, for barter for, for the fish that were um, in abundance. At that time, we know that uh, the oral records tell us that uh, the fish were so numerous that you could essentially walk um, on their backs. So very, very plentiful. Um, and the, of course, there was it, the importance of fish for uh, food as well and um, ceremonial cultural reasons. Uh, if you go to any feast at uh, Saan, there's a very good chance that you're gonna see fish as an important part of that um, feast. Not only that, but uh, it's even tied into things like the clan system, uh, things like that. So it's extremely important. Um, and I will move along. So, if you look back uh, at the time of contact when European settlers first came onto the peninsula, uh, you would have found that um, obviously the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation were, were fishing these waters at that time exclusively. They did uh, lease out small uh, parts of the fishery to some of those um, first settlers. Um, those settlers figured that they wanted a lot more than what Saan were willing to give. Um, and so you saw legislation come into play, uh, including the British North America Act, as well as the Fisheries Act, which were used as tools to um, try and take control of the fishery away from the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Uh, on that, they were um, at least somewhat successful um, and essentially had um, uh, pushed the sawn fisheries to tiny little postage stamps around each First Nation. Uh, now the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation said uh, we never gave up any of these fisheries at any treaties or anything like that. These fisheries are still still ours so um, they fought those charges um, when, when they were put in place. So one of the uh, fishermen, Francis Najawan, had actually been charged with overfishing, decided to fight it. And the chief at the time, Howard Jones as well, was, was brought to court. And ultimately the um, court reaffirmed uh, that yes, indeed, this, the Saugeen Ojibwe nations had that right to the commercial fishery. And today we have uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation solely uh, commercially fishing in Saugeen waters. And you can see um, just the reference to that court case there that we call it the jones Najwan decision, also known as uh, the Justice Fairgrieve decision. So just a little snippet about the Saugeen fishery. So 
the main fish that's harvested is uh, Lake Whitefish, also known as Dickabeg. Um, there's a little bit of har uh, targeting of yellow perch. Uh, and then incidentally, you see catches of uh, lake trout, um, pickerel, I guess you would call it walleye down here, uh, and ciscos. But, and the main uh, means of harvesting fish is is through gill nets for on the commercial side. There's also, um, of course, fish spearing and, and uh, other means of fishing, but those are used more for the food fishery. So we get to the program that I run, the Fisheries Assessment Program. Uh, and the Fisheries Assessment Program was brought in shortly after the jones nagewan decision that I referenced in 1993. Um, and our job is to assess the commercial harvest. So we go to the docks, we meet with the, um, the fish harvesters and we uh, collect samples and um, take records of the total harvest and take individual samples from fish and those kinds of things. We're all, and all of that information is um, put into databases, shared with the joint councils to inform fisheries management. Um, we're also there to help um, in any kind of support capacity that uh, the fishers might have that they need. Um, and uh, just helping with that whole idea of food security and also as of late, have been getting more, more involved on the research side of things. So just a few uh, concepts for uh, everybody that may not be familiar with some of the things that we're uh, involved in at the, the Saugan Ojibwe Nation. So uh, one of those uh, key aspects is this idea of Saugan Ojibwe Nation ecological knowledge. So I talked about this idea that um, the Saugan Ojibwe Nation had been fishing since uh, time immemorial and really what that means is that uh, through that um, long-standing process there's been a great body of knowledge that has been gained over those years and passed down from generation to generation but I don't want you to only think of it as something that kind of existed in the past because that because as people are connected to the lands and waters and things are changing that knowledge is adapting and, and changing along with uh, those changes we're seeing in the lake. So it is adaptive, it's not something stuck in the past that's not useful anymore. It's very, very relevant to today. Uh, and then finally, uh, I wanted to discuss two I'd seen or Eptamunk. Uh, it's a Mi'kmaq term, but uh, we find it useful in, um, in our approach to research. So it's this idea of of looking at um, with two different perspectives or two different eyes. So one eye would be your Western science. A lot of we heard a lot of these presentations today with all the uh, fancy graphs. Uh, and then uh, the other eye would be thinking about um, the Saugan Ojibwe Nation ecological knowledge. So that knowledge that we talked about a few a few uh, minutes ago. And also the importance of having um, membership directly involved in our research. So, for example, hiring our fish, fishers to come out and uh, catch fish or those kinds of things or, or do sampling. So just a very uh, briefly, I'll just kind of uh, look a little bit more into this idea of these two different knowledge systems. So there, there are a lot of differences, but you'll see um, that there is some overlap as well. Um, I don't really have enough time probably to get too into detail, but um, really when you look at it, um, Western science tends to take a very reductionist approach, whereas um, I, I see um, saw knowledge is more of a holistic uh, type of knowledge and, and the way that that knowledge is is gathered in, in many ways is different as well. But as we can see, there's also some, some commonalities as well. And um, again, I probably don't have time to get too much into that today, but just this idea that although there's differences, there's also commonalities as well. 
So why would we want to embark on something called two-eyed seeing? Well, um, as everyone here is very well aware, I am sure, the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Huron certainly are not in the best of shape. Um, we've done a pretty good job at uh, screwing it up pretty badly. And uh, the reality is that um, if we want to try and figure things out, uh, having more than one source of knowledge, having uh, indigenous knowledge along with Western science is a way to gain some, some further perspective, some further knowledge. Um, it's a source, as it says here, of inventiveness. So coming up with novel ideas learning from each other and um, just generating some new approaches uh, and trying to figure out what we can do to try and uh, try and heal some of the, the damage that has been done. So that's really the approach that we've been taking on all our research. Um, just a little bit about, I won't get too much into this because you're all uh, more than familiar with all the things that have gone wrong in uh, Lake Huron. Uh, and that's the sole graph that I have <laughs> in this presentation. As I said, I won't be focused too much on that. And yeah, if you're at the back, you probably can't read it too well, but I'm sure you're all aware that um, the uh, Lake Whitefish populations have suffered a dramatic decline. Um, I think back to 2008 when I started with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, and uh, I used to go to um, a port that's called uh, Howden Vale and it used to be uh, like a temporary village down at Howden Vale in the fall uh, because there were so many um, so many of the membership that would gather to um, harvest fish and there would be people just dedicated to gutting fish and uh, doing nets and um, packing the fish and all these kind and then there'd be others coming in with the harvest and like I said, it was it was a real thriving little temporary village that would just erupt at that time of year for the fall harvest. Um, I'm sad to say that we're down to one full-time commercial fisher uh, as of today, and that's because of all the um, the damage that has been done to Lake Huron um, as a result of all those things that uh, we've heard about today and yesterday. Uh, and we have a, a new project that we're just starting uh, and it's a result of some work that we did with membership to learn a little bit more about what uh, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation membership wanted uh, us as uh, the fisheries assessment program uh, to do about things like the decline in Lake Whitefish. And it was, uh, so we went and uh, we held community uh, meetings, we, uh, we had surveys, we had interviews, all those kinds of things. And from that, we, uh, we put together a, a paper that was more for sharing with um, groups like this than, uh, than with membership. We shared that information back to membership in other ways because uh, this, I don't even think many people read this kind of thing, but anyway, um, we put together a paper and if you're interested you can check it out and in that we kind of got our marching orders from membership about what they wanted us to do so as a result of that uh, we put uh, we put together a project uh, in partnership with the ministry of natural resources as well as uh, parks canada called together with gigo yuck and um, we were really lucky to have um, one of the membership that's a really good artist put together this logo for us. And uh, uh, if you want to learn more about that logo, if you look on the Chippewas of Nawash um, YouTube channel, you can actually um, see a couple uh, videos that we put together that will go into the deep meaning that's actually behind this logo, um, and as well as our projects in general. So I really recommend checking that out for those that are interested. So in addition to that, we, um, we really don't historically get along too well with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, so the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, have been um, 
enemies, essentially, um, since uh, before the jones Najwa decision. Um, and so it wasn't this idea that we were going to embark on some research together wasn't an easy um, concept, wasn't an easy idea to sell to anyone um, because of that uh, long-term animosity. Uh, so we actually had to try and figure out a way to work together, which wasn't easy. Um, so we did put together an initial framework, um, which I'll share a paper, I think, later on that you can take a look at that initial framework. But um, uh, then from there, um, I was having a discussion with um, Councillor Nick Saunders, who's at the back there today. Uh, and uh, he was taking a look at... Uh, at the framework he had put, we had put together, and then he, he kind of uh, came up with this idea to reinterpret that framework into something that's more, um, more embedded in the the cultural teachings of the Saga New Jibri Nation, which is what you see here today. And again, I I know that I'm short on time, so I I can't get into uh, too much of the details. And really, Nick Nick uh, is the best one to do that anyway. Um, but anyway, we put together this framework that you see here just to figure out how to work together in a good way. So I mentioned about this idea that we were doing uh, using a two-eyed seeing approach to try and figure out how we could help uh, Dickamag or Lake Whitefish. And of course, with two-eyed seeing, we need to have both eyes, and one of those eyes is the Saugeen you know, Ojibwe Nation ecological knowledge. Uh, and the way that we have gathered that is by having interviews with uh, many of the um, membership. I think we're up to over 60 interviews. We're in the process of transcribing those, uh, which is largely done. Um, and then now we're kind of at the point where we're starting to, to um, actually send those interviews back to the membership so that they can take a look at those, those uh, transcripts and make sure that we captured everything right and that they're, they're happy with what we've done and, and give us permission to move ahead with uh, our projects. So that's the stage we're at right now. Um, and there's all kinds of information that you can learn from doing uh, not only the interviews, but also we use mapping as a tool to kind of learn about uh, some of this, the information. Uh, everybody, certainly fishers, if you uh, set a map down uh, that they're familiar with and the waters, they love to talk about, um, you know, all the, the uh, related information, their fishing activities, the stories and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, we find it a really good tool. And just to provide a, a little bit of an example about uh, what we're currently doing with Lake Whitefish, this is um, some work that um, uh, Alexander Duncan uh, did in my office there a um, few years back now with Cisco. So we were trying to figure out a little bit more about the movement and uh, distribution and abundance of Cisco, and uh, this is the, these polygons uh, represent a lot of the information, as well as the lines represent movement, but the polygons just indicate the different um, areas where Cisco were found. Uh, and that includes, of course, the shallow water forms or the Ardenai, as well as the, um, the deep water. So from that, we were, um, we were able to learn a lot about um, historically, especially those um, deep water um, those deep water chubs or ciscos that um, were originally, like say back in the 90s, those were a big commercial uh, fish, but um, they had disappeared. And a lot of the the membership were saying, you know, what's going on with, with cisco? Are they still around or are they still there? So we did some work with membership to figure out where, where they used to be and we went back out and sure enough, they're actually still there. They're just really small. <laughs> they're no longer the uh, commercial harvestable uh, kind of uh, size that they were, so. And I realize that I am running out of time and uh, I have a lot of slides to go. 
<laughs> so uh, we actually ended up taking the Cisco to our friend uh, Randy Eschenroder, who I believe is here today. And uh, he helped us with uh, learning how to do morphometrics and meristics on these. And um, I believe that there was a, a, for, a new form of um, uh, the herring or the uh, shallow water Cisco that was um, described as a result of that work. So it was pretty neat to uh, be a part of that. And, and, and funnily enough, um, you know, we, we always heard about these from our um, from the sod fishers, but they were they weren't really known, I guess, too much outside of that local uh, that uh, indigenous knowledge. So, kind of interesting uh, turn of events there. So, just a just a picture of one of our fishers that we had hired to go out and and uh, collect those. Um, those deep water chubs and uh, the excitement on their faces as they brought up these fish that they hadn't seen in many years because they had stopped fishing them. It was, it was quite incredible. So pretty neat, neat moment. Oh, we're also involved with acoustic, uh, big uh, lake-wide acoustic telemetry project um, that is, um, uh, involves quite a few different partners. I imagine some of them are here today. Um, and I, pro I won't get too much in more into detail other than to say that we were trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out a little bit more about the movements of Dick and Meg. That was one of the things that uh, came out of that uh, work that we did with membership. And uh, so just taking a, a, a look at uh, the movements and just trying to figure out a little bit more about that, to, hopefully in a way, in uh, ultimately to help those Dick and Meg out and, and how to hopefully reverse some of those negative trends or understand what's going on there. So aside from acoustic telemetry, uh, we're also doing some habitat and, and shoal work um, as well. So that's a kind of some, another thing that was identified as kind of a critical um, piece. Uh, we're still kind of on early days on, on this but uh, we're currently in some, some talks to uh, get more, uh, more in depth with this stuff, including uh, hopefully some promising developments with um, Peter Esselman and his uh, fancy uh, gadgets to go out and explore the, the uh, using uh, autonomous uh, underwater vehicles. So. Uh, we also you, uh, have used some ROVs, but uh, didn't turn out the ROV didn't turn out quite as well as what we hoped. It ended up being very prone to breaking on us. Um, in addition to that, we're involved on a GLFC project on Lake Whitefish and Lake Trout. So that was funded by the GLFC, uh, and this was uh, out, based out of concern that we had been hearing from membership about the impacts of. Lake Trout on Lake Whitefish. So, um, currently uh, doing a, uh, still do uh, finishing up the transcripts, as I said, on our interview part of things. But um, I think I heard a comment yesterday after the Lake Trout presentation about um, kind of the impacts of some of the impacts of Lake Trout uh, that the commercial fishers have been seeing. And um, out of the interviews that we've done, I certainly have seen a lot of evidence um, for very much the same sentiments that we heard in those comments yesterday. So uh, certainly something um, to be aware of and, uh, um, and I think certainly needs some more thought about what's going on with that Lake Trout uh, Rehabilitation Program. So as I mentioned, uh, we, we did, uh, out of that work, we did create an article that had that framework for how we work together, as I mentioned earlier. And if you want to learn more about that, you can take a look at this article that will walk you through that process. Um, and I'm reaching the end, but I'm just going to talk briefly about fish stalking. Fish stalking is an absolutely terrible practice for the most part. Um, and I know that the GLFC has a, a lot of interest in fish stocking, but um, 
The results of uh, the stocking of non-native fish species has absolutely been uh, terrible. Um, and I think that if, uh, if that same concept had not been tried in the past and people came up with it today, I don't think there's any way that would have passed any kind of um, uh, environmental uh, impact assessments or anything like that. Um, there's certainly in the work that uh, we've done with membership, we've identified a lot of uh, not only ecological effects from stocking these non-native uh, species, but also um, effects, uh, very negative effects on um, the ability of membership to um, go out and fish and make a livelihood, the ability to, um, you know, engage in culture, a loss in, um, in uh, the revenue generated out of the fishery, uh, for the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, this practice has been an absolute terrible disaster, and I can't stress that enough. So, um, you know, I know the recreational fishery places a lot of uh, pressure on uh, the GLFC and other organizations to keep this practice up, but um, it's really not the way forward, and I, I, I can't stress that enough. There needs to be a, a significant review of this current practice. So we see ongoing these uh, fish being stocked in saw waters, unfortunately. And we see the negative results. And finally, um, education. So we try and get out in, uh, to the local school that's just actually right across the road from our fisheries building and uh, getting some of the youth involved in some of the work that we're doing and showing them some fish and they get to play in the fish guts and um, they have a good time. So with that, I think I'm probably well over my time and I'd just like to say thank you and uh, that'll be it. Thanks, Brett.